So, Angular best practices. Let's start from the beginning, right? What is a best practice? And uh, to get an idea, I took some quotes from the internet, so let's take a look. Uh, yeah. So, in short, we can say that a best practice is a generally accepted solution to a problem that has organically grown over years of trial and error. And that means that those uh, practices were not invented instantly. They all start with a small guideline and they evolved over time. Um, and that all because of feedback of their adopters. And best practices are generally known to be superior to other alternatives. And that means that best practices are constantly being challenged, not only by their adopters, but also by uh, other best practices and methodologies. And a good example of such a best practice is the uh, WCAG, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And they re represent the globally uh, recognized accessibility guidelines on the internet, and they are maintained by the W3, W3C. So what kind of best practices apply to Angular? Um, and just to be clear, today I will not discuss um, practices on how to organize your code or your project architecture, and I will also not focus on which state management system to use and not even on current actual debates, like for example, signals versus observables. Uh, today I want to talk more about foundational basics that span across any kind of setup and even uh, any kind of web project, so not only uh, Angular. Before we continue, very short, who am I? Um, I'm Sam, <laughs> and I'm a front-end magician, I like to call myself, because apparently uh, uh, people on the team are always uh, very uh, surprised by how, how quick the, uh, the front end can move compared to a back end, um, as we are only two on the, on the front end side at my, at my company currently, and I think about 20 uh, or close to 20 back end engineers. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a, a small front end team for a, for a very ba a big back end team. But I've been playing with the web uh, as a software engineer for about 15 years now. And my sole focus has always been in the browser. So I've never did anything else. I've only uh, worked with HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript. And that brought me to Angular. So I work at Core. And Core is a promising fintech startup. Uh, we started in the US, and we are currently already expanding globally. I also serve as a GDE. And GDE is short for Google Developer Expert. Uh, that basically means that I'm uh, in support of the Angular and web communities uh, by organizing uh, meetups, conferences, uh, also presenting, uh, also writing and mentoring other developers. And last, but definitely not least, um, I'm a father of Milo and Max, a partner of Zoe, um, and those two boys are very exhaustive, uh, so I really do not want to, uh, to uh, make that sound light. It's very... Uh, very hard. So <laughs> if you want to learn more about me or the things that I do, please check out my website. And to end my introduction, just a little bit more on the company uh, that I started together with Jürgen van der Moore. Um, I've started it, uh, we've started it in 2016, and we mainly work around initiatives in the uh, uh, community of Angular developers, like for example, the Angular Belgium uh, meetup group and the yearly NGBE conference. And true our initiatives over the years, we have facilitated training for thousands of developers um, in and around Belgium. And of course, with the help of some amazing people, of which you can some, see some here in the picture. You might even see Manfred here. here. Here's Manfred. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Michael. And uh, yeah, you might recognize others. Um, they are the real driving people behind a uh, conference. Those are the speakers, the trainers. Uh, yeah, those are the, the people who make it great. So uh, yeah, that's how I got to know Manfred. So uh, after seven years, we're still uh, happy uh, working together. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, where is he? Where's Manfred? Thanks again, Manfred, for inviting me today. Thank you. So uh, these three are the, the best practices I would like to cover today. Uh, the first one is staying up to date. Second one is uh, making sure that your Angular applications are secure. And the last one uh, is about creating accessible uh, applications. And let's start with staying up to date. Okay. 
staying up to date is sometimes the easiest uh, best practice, but it can potentially also be the hardest, uh, as updating your project dependencies might be tricky. Uh, for example, because of a lot of third-party uh, libraries that you use in your projects, uh, and they also need to follow the upgrade cycles of Angular. So they need to publish a new version before the they can also be upgraded. And even worse, sometimes maintainers abandon or tempor temporarily lose focus on their project. So with Angular moving so fast by publishing a new version each six months, breaking changes might occur uh, rather quickly. Uh, they might occur every year. So that requires maintainers to keep focus and follow the Angular releases. So let me start with a, a hot take. In general, I recommend to avoid using third-party libraries uh, for Angular as much as possible. And, well, obviously I don't mean all of them, uh, because you, yeah, you don't want to make everything yourself, obviously. But especially those very small, simple uh, wrapper libraries around other JavaScript libraries. For example, the ng-qr code is a basic wrapper around the QR code package. And it does not much more than just wrap <coughs> the QR code package with a simple directive and a component and passes through the configuration. So why would you not just use a QR code package uh, yourself directly and wrap it if you need to wrap it? Why? It will make you stay in full control of this dependency and not have a, um, a step in between with the ng-QR code. Just want to make sure that I have nothing but respect for the people uh, who make those kinds of packages because they also can uh, give you a good, a good example on how you should wrap it yourself, and perhaps you can contribute to, to those packages uh, yourself. So the general advice I want to give here as a best practice is that to make sure that you can keep upgrading uh, your Angular dependencies timely. And if you cannot follow immediately, because of, uh, for example, a lot of those third-party uh, dependencies, Angular has most likely got you covered, uh, at least if you're using a long-term support version. And why is that? Uh, important security patches uh, will be made on each of those major versions in the long-term support. Um, currently, that's version 15 to version 17, so be aware that version 14 uh, recently dropped out of long-term support. So that will give you and the maintainers of third-party libraries about one to one and a half years for making sure that uh, they upgrade timely. So how can you keep your project uh, dependencies up to date? Uh, there are various ways to do that. Uh, and in this case, we are considering the uh, node package manager as an example. Just keep in mind that the, the other uh, package, man package managers, like for example, PMPM or, um, or Yarn, they most probably have similar tools. And maybe somebody's already using Bun. No? Yeah, using Bun. Yeah. Do you know if they have tools like that? Just try it out if it works with only Angular. Hmm. That's already a very good try, yes. I think. <laughs> All right, so yeah. if you want to focus on updating your Angular dependencies, you can use uh, the Angular CLI and ng update. If you use NX and you want to migrate your NX uh, project to the latest NX uh, dependencies, you can use NX migrate latest. Those two commands, however, will primarily focus on um, uh, Angular and uh, NX related dependencies. So um, you, you can, I, I believe you can also use them to check the other, uh, other your other dependencies, but if you want to list all your current dependencies and their current wanted and the very latest version, you can use npm outdated. And if you just want to go um, and update your dependencies, you can uh, directly do npm update and just update them. So here we see an example of the output of npm outdated command. And what we see here is that uh, we list all our dependencies with the current the wanted and the latest version. And I realize today that it's probably not the very best example because I don't know exactly why, but I tend to ver fix, um, fix my versions in package.json uh, without using a, a tilt or a, or a caret. And that's why you see the current and wanted uh, to be the same one. 
But um, yeah, so what we see in the wanted version, the wanted version is the version that matches with the latest version within the range of that specific package that you defined in your package.json. Um, and obviously, you need to consider semantic versioning for that. Huh? So a tilt will match the latest patch available, and a caret will match the latest minor uh, upgrade that is available. The latest column is the very, very latest version available for that package, um, while it's not considering your explicit version range in the, the package.json. Of course, we also have the Angular update guide available, and you can use this guide to get uh, the initial idea of the work that you need to do to upgrade between two major versions. Just keep in mind that each project is unique, obviously, so the instructions that are given here are just to give you a head start. Then staying up to date uh, with changing features in the framework can also be very challenging, but Angular and even more NX uh, has got us covered through automatic migrations. And for those who still remember, uh, a few years back, we, for example, we had automatic migrations for RxJS, and more recently for migrating from uh, module, uh, modules to standalone components. And now with the new control flow syntax, for example, you are able to use uh, auto-migrations for the bigger part of your code base. Then, next up, security. Angular has some built-in security protection uh, against most com common vulnerabilities. And that sure ain't uh, security through obscurity, because yeah, obviously all parts of our front-end code are always visible to any visitor of the web application. But Angular, uh, however, does protect us against um, most common attacks, such as cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. And one of the best ways to keep your, uh, uh, your applications secure is by keeping up to date with your dependencies. Uh, so, yeah, we got that covered already. And for example, uh, cross-site scripting is one of the most common attacks on the web. It happens when attackers are able to execute uh, injected code in your applications. So, Important to know is that Angular treats all values um, as untrusted by default, and it will sanitize them when they are injected into the DOM or executed as part of your JavaScript. So keep in mind that if there is an attack, it most probably means that a developer made it possible. Um, so if you do need to inject content, such as HTML or CSS or JavaScript directly, you can use the DOM sanitizer uh, util class, which is provided by Angular. And you should only do this if you are sure that you are protected against cross-site scripting attacks uh, through a different mechanism. Uh, for example, you, are, um, you have checks in place that will sanitize or clean up any user-generated content before it gets into your database. And yeah, just keep in mind that any modern backend stack uh, probably has some utility functions or classes uh, available for you that will that will clean up uh, user data. And there are other more detailed ways to, uh, to protect yourself against uh, those kinds of attacks. Uh, one of it is trusted types, and another one is content security policy. But I'm not gonna go into detail on that because yeah, you cannot explain that in a few minutes. So there are two HTTP level uh, vulnerabilities for which Angular has built-in prevention mechanisms. The first one is cross-site request forgery, and the other one is cross-site script inclusion. But today I will focus primarily on uh, cross-site request forgery because uh, cross-site script inclusion became somewhat irrelevant uh, when Angular dropped support for non-modern browsers, like for example Internet Explorer. The attack, uh, so cross-site scripting, has been made a lot harder by uh, the fact that modern browsers are applying the same origin policies. Also very interesting topic, same origin policies. Um, I invite you to, to take a deeper look, but I'm not gonna uh, go too deep into that today. Um, I'll just explain you how you can um, mitigate cross-site request forgery in Angular or in your complete uh, setup. Uh, um, cross-site request forgery can be mitigated by sending a nonce from the server in a cookie to the client and back when you make uh, a call to the backend using a header. 
it has to be the same value as it was provided, or else the server will say, okay, something has happened here. So, although this is mostly a server-side technique, Angular has got us covered with built-in support for the client-side part, and you can see that, you can see that here. Um, the only thing that you need to do is call the with XSRF configuration function when you are setting up the HTTP client. And if you wish, you can also set up a, a custom cookie name and a header name. If you do find a security bug that is related to the framework, you might get yourself a nice surprise uh, because Angular is part of the Google Open Source soft Software Vulner Vulnerability Reward Program. And that's a mouthful, sorry. Um, so if you have belief, uh, if you have if you believe that you have found a major issue, uh, be sure to report it because I think it, the, the, those bounties are pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Then there's a lot to be said about accessibility on the web. And obviously for Angular, that's not much different because Angular is just a web application. But there are specific things to consider when um, improving the accessibility of your Angular applications. And the first thing that you can do is elevate your applications uh, with ARIA attributes. And I'm not going to go over the entire specification uh, of ARIA and its full potential, but I will give you a few examples. ARIA Live, for example, is an uh, attribute that you can use to indicate to screen readers that whatever is inside that block is likely to change over time or because of user interaction. So whenever the user is idle, then the screen reader will, will decide, okay, now I have the time to announce this to the, to the user and it will speak out loud whatever text that is inside uh, this block. So in this case, it's a, a list of toasts. Typically those toasts are something that you would use to uh, signal that uh, an error happened on the backend or uh, when validating a form, for example. Then another perhaps more well-known example is the um, ARIA label. And we can use that um, to, uh, to provide meaningful content to an element that might not have textual content inside. Like for example, in this case, we have a button with an SVG that represents a close button. So typically this is a cross that you would, uh, that you would show, but a screen, a screen reader cannot interpret SVGs. So we need to help it with providing a meaningful uh, label to the button. Now, a question for the attentive listeners and readers. Can you see two recent additions to the framework capabilities in this slide? Yes, you win a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> You even get two because you Thank got them all. Very nice. So it's when using those uh, ARIA labels, ARIA attributes, it's important to use the attribute prefix whenever you want to bind to dynamic values. So um, I will show you why. Because, for example, in the simplified example here that we see with a email uh, form validation, we dynamically add the ARIA described by attribute when there is an error. So in the ternary operator that we see here, we see that if there's not an error, we, put it to, uh, we set the value to null. And null means that in this case, the um, attribute will be completely removed by the, uh, from the DOM. So the screen reader or whatever assistive technology will not see this attribute anymore. And we also use the area live polite uh, attribute here. If you want more control beyond just HTML markup uh, in your application code uh, to announce those updates to the screen reader, you can also use the live announcer, which is provided by the Angular CDK. And the live announcer uses similar techniques as with the area live attribute, but it will handle that magic for you. And I think, in essence, what it does, it just adds an ARIA Live um, diff to the bottom of the page and uses the same technique, which I've just shown you. But in this case, you can call it from your, um, from your business logic um, 
to make sure that the uh, screen reader will read it out loud. Then, another very important implementation error that I've seen multiple times in projects is that developers are trying to reinvent the wheel and it's in 90% of the cases around buttons. So the general advice as a best practice here is that you should avoid creating your own elements if the native elements uh, that are provided by the browser are already doing the heavy lifting for you. So if you wish to improve native elements like the button uh, here, it's better to use a directive instead of a component that tries to recreate the same capabilities. If you want to see more <laughs> extensive or better examples, um, a good place is to check uh, the Angular Material project. The, ang the Material button and the table components are, are, um, are an example of this. Um, and you can also check how the Angular team is doing it. Then another hidden gem in the Angular router package is the ARIA current when active uh, directive. And although, although it's clearly documented, I've not seen much, use, much usage of it before. Um, and to be honest, I also only recently discovered this uh, since a few months. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's important. Um, and it's also very easy to add, so, uh, so just add it. Uh, and I've provided two examples. The first example is just to indicate in a typical navigation uh, of, your, of your application which page is active. And on the right side, we see a multi-step navigation where we can clearly indicate which is the current active step. Then the next few tips are about uh, focusing on navigation or focusing in general. So as a developer, you should decide where focus goes after page navigation. And to achieve that, you can use the navigation end event of the router um, to reclaim or update the focus on your page. And the goal of this technique is to avoid that focus becomes, again, on the first element of your page, uh, of, of your body, um, and to make sure that the, the content that you have loaded is usable right away. And to stay in the context of focus, Another one of my favorites is trapping the focus, for example, with, um, with dialogues or with flyouts. Um, uh, you can use the CDK trap focus directive for that. And if you want to uh, have even more control, you can use the CDK focus region start and uh, region end to indicate uh, between which elements the focus should be, tra focus should be trapped. And if you want to have more control and define the initial focus, you can use the CDK focus initial uh, directive. If you want to learn more about all of this, uh, be sure to check out the Google uh, Code Labs. There's a dedicated lab that focuses on accessibility in uh, Angular applications. And there's a lot more content in here if you want to upgrade your technical skills. I think not only for um, yeah, as you can see, not only for web applications, but also for, for any other Google uh, technologies. That was quite a lot. So uh, if you want to read more on all of these topics, um, when I share the slides, I will include a page with, a link, uh, with links to all of the resources that I've used to set up the, uh, the presentation. And yeah, the, indeed, that was a lot to digest uh, in such a short period, of, short period of time. So let's wrap up and conclude with the fact that a major framework like Angular follows best practices. Best practices. And Angular and its ecosystem also give us the tools to apply general web development best practices in our projects. Following these best practices is not only the base for developing our modern uh, applications, but it also allows us to keep our applications secure and up to date while they grow over the years. And while accessibility is a big part um, of develop developing Angular applications, luckily there's not much to it for Angular specifically, uh, because we can easily use techniques that apply to any uh, web development project on the web like, for example, the ARIA and the WCAG uh, guidelines. Thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know.